Next speaker is the uh, creator, co-creator of uh, an automated testing tool called Calabash. Uh, please welcome Carl Kruko. Well, my name is Carl Kruko. I'm uh, responsible for the iOS infrastructure at a company called Less Painful. We're a small um, Danish company, so um, we actually traveled about I guess 9,000 kilometers miles to go here. Um, so. I'm going to tell a bit about the company during the presentation, but mostly the presentation is about Calabash, which is an open source tool that we've developed. Um, since we only have 20 minutes, it's going to be very overview and not very technical. If you do have any technical questions, please come talk to us afterwards. We are happy to talk technical stuff. Uh, but this is kind of at the overview level. Um, also, okay, my, yeah, the guy walking over there looking like a Viking. <laughs> Red beard. Uh, he's the Danish Viking. He's developing the Android side of it, and he's also happy to take questions. Well, anyway, um, so let's just start out with a bit of motivation. I mean, this is a testing conference for mobile, so you know all this stuff, but I kind of like to set the picture anyway. So you know that we have multiple devices. Um, on iOS, we have, I guess, now four versions of the iPad, and uh, numerous versions of the iPhone. Um, iPod Touch and so on. And for Android, it's just, it's just this stuff, right? And for Reach, we want to try and span as many platforms as we can. Usually, it depends on the app, of course, but usually we want to span as much as we can. And besides hardware, you have uh, different operating systems. You have different operating system versions. Um, the hardware has different screen sizes, have different resolutions, and so on. So all this kind of poses a challenge for testing. So um, I'd say that um, varying conditions in terms of network and location is one of, one of the things that makes testing kind of cumbersome in the sense that, say, if you want to test how your app works, if you're moving between an edge or a 3G network, then you have to actually kind of move from an edge to a 3G network or to lose connectivity. Or um, actually, since the device is, is uh, check, tracking location and your app probably depends on location, then to test that, oh, maybe you need to move to a location. Rotation affects the, the uh, way the app works, and of course phone settings like language uh, will affect how the app works. And all this just adds up into how much testing you need to do compared to sort of other platforms. And um, from my experience, I have a background in, in development. Uh, for mobile, this is often a practice, like a manual process, and it's repetitive. Uh, you have fairly low coverage; that's expensive. Um, and the coverage you have, depending on how you how structured you are, it's kind of uh, what phones or tablets the developer kind of has. So um, you get this insufficient device coverage, and recursions do occur. Even so, something worked last week; it's probably not going to work next week because somebody changed something. So the, the burden is there. So I think there's really value in, in trying to automate this, which is why we're all here, of course. So another thing I want to stress is about the philosophy, like your approach to when you do automated testing. I'll just tell you uh, ours. Um, you can have a different opinion, but this is our approach to it, is that we, we recognize that there's value in automated testing that's beyond having automated regressions. That can be more value, specifically if you practice uh, BDD, Behavior Driven Development, and TDD, you can ha exploit um, the fact that, so in BDD you phrase your, your test as in a business readable language, um, and those will actually drive the test. Um, but the, the thing you get is that you have an increased communication inside the team. Um, because the tests are written in a natural language, in the language of your business, anybody on the team and even the team's managers can understand this. And if a test fails, you know uh, which business feature is broken and not some, some technical thing that this particular unit test or acceptance test failed. So um, we really believe that this is an additional value that you can, you can take if you, if you take this approach to testing. So just as an example, if you don't know, uh, this is from Cucumber. Um, uh, in Cucumber, you structure your, your specifications or tests as features. And each feature is just a text file that's readable in, in human language. 
Um, so here's a feature for login. This is the WordPress app. It's an open source uh, mobile app that you can, um, you can go get the source code. Uh, it's there for Android and iOS. Um, and it has some uh, web components. So for testing, it's actually a pretty good challenge. You have multiple platforms. You have web uh, hybrid stuff. And, and it's open source, so it's a good example. But anyway, anybody can read this, right? It says, um, to, so there's a feature in the app which is login. Um, and a feature consists of a number of scenarios, which corresponds more or less to, to use cases. So one scenario is invalid login, given I'm about to log in. When I enter invalid credentials, then I'm presented with an error message. And if that fails, you know that that particular business feature is not working anymore. Um, another scenario uh, would be logging in. So you have multiple scenarios that concentrate around the same business feature. And the, the, so the magic thing when you see it at first uh, is that at, while this is a plain text specification, uh, it's also an acceptance test that can be automatically executed. Um, and the way it works with a tool called Cucumber is that each of those uh, given when then, those are called steps, they have what are called step definitions, which are blocks of regular code that execute when you execute that step. So they have a technical side and a business facing side. Uh, it's, it's related to what, what Peach Hodgson was saying earlier. So um, this is our approach. We use this technology. So what is Calabash? It's a tool for doing BDD style testing. Um, it consists of um, two projects, project for Android, Calabash Android, and project for iOS. You can go to GitHub and check out the source. Um, it's, it's like the core development is done by us. But it's, it's truly open source, and we do encourage people to contribute and to uh, discuss on the forums and uh, create issues and certainly do pull requests. Um, the license is Eclipse public license, so it's fairly non-restrictive. Uh, the code is written in a number of languages. Um, Objective-C for the iOS part, server part, uh, Java for the Android server part. And there's Ruby, and that's the language of, of choice for writing these Cucumber step definitions. So you phrase your tests in Ruby. Um, we have a project which is called Calabash JVM, which is right now a kind of a proof of concept, a work in process, uh, progress, where you can phrase these using uh, Cucumber for JVM. That's a project that's out there. You can use that to execute your test, but write the step definitions in, say, Java or any other JVM-based uh, language. And I know there are a number of people that are interested in this, and there are even some people that are doing their own Java-based clients. So that's the um, kind of the overview. If you look at the, the feature level, uh, what Calabash uh, does is that it supports native but also hybrid apps for Android and iOS. So this means if you have a, a native app that embeds web views, you can actually look into those web views and query into what text or DOM elements are there. You can interact with them. You can touch them, uh, type into the keyboard, and so on. And it's, it's uh, uh, primitive right now, but it actually gets a lot of work done simply by looking at stuff, asserting that DOM elements are there, and also, um, of course, touching them. So BDD is done via Cucumber. Um, and a goal for the project is to try and do this cross-platform testing that Pete was talking about, where you try and maximize the sharing you can have. If you're building the same app for several platforms, let's say Android, iOS, iPad, uh, sorry, iPhone, iPad, then even though the apps are different, there are still going to be a lot of common stuff. And you want to try and maximize the reusage of all that common stuff. So that's a definite goal, pro the goal for the project. Another kind of... Um, important aspect of, of Calabash is that we want to support running on physical devices, real devices, equally well as simulators. So because um, that's kind of the, like the business side of it from our point of view is being able to run on physical devices. I'll tell you about this in a minute. Another kind of feature that's, that's different from maybe some of the other open source projects is that uh, there is a commercial side behind it. Um, and that's, that will give you like value added if you were using Calabash and you want to so you get support, or well, you can come to us and buy a support subscription. We can help you. And this, for some, it doesn't matter, but for some companies, it's really important that there is, uh, you can actually get help. You're guaranteed that you can get, you can get help. And the likelihood of the project disappearing uh, in six months when the core developer finds something else to do uh, is less. So uh, that's kind of the, what makes it maybe unique to some of the other projects. 
Architecturally, it's, it's, it's very similar to uh, many of the other cool projects we're seeing here is that you have a client server. So um, the Calabash server is something that's sitting kind of next to your app uh, and will, it will handle all the interaction with your app. So, so your app can be on device or a simulator and the Calabash server will uh, look into the state of the views. Uh, it will perform touch events, um, do maybe if you need to do kind of reflective calls, you can do that. Um, so that's on that side. On the client side, uh, you have a number of libraries. You have Calabash Android and Calabash iOS, which are Ruby libraries, and this kind of work in progress, Calabash JVM. And those just speak HTTP using a, a JSON protocol here. So it's very similar to, to the other architectures we've, we've seen today. Just a bit more detail about Calabash Android. Um, it's based on instrumentation, but it's, it's because you have embedded this HTTP server, you have more of a dynamic experience. You can send it commands from any language you want to do. Um, and you can sort of have an interactive experience where you, uh, uh, you pop up a, like a shell terminal and try out different test commands and see how that works with your, with your app. It's using uh, Robotium uh, internally, so you have the full power of that available if you're using Calabash Android. But then it adds additional methods to, to ease uh, testing. And it's built in a way so that it's, it's easy if you have some particular component you need to, to interact with, it's fairly easy to extend it and add new actions and then build your own version. The, the hybrid, the web support, is based on a, a very, very small, tiny JavaScript library, which is called Calabash JS, which is kind of the, uh, the attempt to have a, a shared code base for doing this. Um, for Calabash iOS and, and Calabash Android. Um, and you can go look at that. For iOS, the, uh, the, it's still the same architecture. You have, you have the server next to your app, but in this case, the app is, sorry, the server is linked into the app uh, using a static library. And the way that works is that it uses a combination of some private ABIs for performing touch events and then uh, UI automation. Um, you to actually do the, the, the touch synthesis. Uh, it also has this notion of interactive test environment where you can, um, you can try out what your tests are going to look like before you actually um, run them. So it's kind of hard to, to explain what that interactive development experience is like, but I can show you if you want to see, you can come up afterwards and I'll show you what that looks like. But the point is that it will speed up your, uh, like how long time it takes to develop a test, have that work. It's based on uh, Frank. Uh, but has some like changes to the core parts. The, the view selection engine is one, uh, where that's this, this web uh, hybrid support. Uh, some additional reflective capabilities and stuff like, like predicates, NS predicates, and some stuff on um, filtering out elements that aren't visible. So it's, it's a bit more expressive. Uh, on the touch synthesis side, that's also a uh, difference from the, the Frank stuff. Um, but I'm thinking in the future we uh, Pete released this public automation library, and I think that could be uh, the main library where we put in the touch synthesis stuff using private APIs. Another kind of difference is that uh, where's it going to go in the future? Uh, for us, the, I think the, the future uh, is going to look at a unification of the APIs. If you look at it right now, Calabash iOS and Calabash Android, they have different APIs. They're not similar enough. And in the future, we're going to try and merge that and have more similar. So um, I'll just show you an example. Um, so this was the one I had from the WordPress before. So one scenario that, uh, that checks that if you enter in valid credentials, you get appropriate area message, and one that actually does the login. I'll just see, uh, it's just, just a video recording of this. Have this run on, sorry. Have this run on iOS. If that video is actually running, it is okay. Yep. So that was the first scenario and asserted the presence of an invalid login message. It looks cool with the keyboard. <laughs> it's really fast. And this will wait for animations and then. Take a screen. So it's just an example. It's a very simple example. Uh, but here's the same thing running for Android. So this was recorded on a um, very slow machine, so it's moving quite slowly, and the emulator is quite slow. But it's running the same kind of use case.
the login going on, and you get the invalid login message there on the bottom. Yeah, sorry, sound's on, because I need sound in a minute. That was an email. I'll run the next. When the video was on, it's like it completely slowed down the computer, so sorry about that. And this is an example here. It's a very simple example, but it's still an example where you have the same feature. You even have the same step definitions at the Cucumber level. Those are shared across platforms, and it's now running on, on both. And then you have these page objects that implement the platform-specific details. Yeah, there we go. So just a few words about um, like the future of where's this going. Um, one thing I already kind of mentioned this is that we are going to try and unify the API so that even at, if you go to the implementation of these page objects, um, those are going to right now look very, very different. But we could try and exploit having a similar structure of the API so it's easier to learn. You may even have increased code, uh, code usage. Um, another thing is to try and improve the hybrid support. So right now, as I said, it's, um, it's fairly low level. It just uses uh, CSS or XPath selectors, and then it will filter out. If you find a DOM element that's not visible, it will filter that out. Uh, and then you basically perform touch events on, the, on those XY coordinates for that DOM element. So uh, it's not based on, you don't specify I'm going to touch XY, you specify I'm going to touch the CSS selector. And the implementation is you figure out the XY coordinate and touch that. The other thing is the, uh, we were going to build an official JVM uh, client so that people are already starting to build them, but we want to have uh, an official one. And uh, the ones that are already building, we want you to try and contribute to this so we can have a shared project with JVM support. Because a lot of people we speak to, JVM, our Java support basically is, is really, really important. And then I think this is a really, really cool event because we, we are already seeing kind of cross-pollination happening, right? We have a lot of cool projects that's telling about their implementation and that spawns ideas. And I already have a few ideas on how we can um, unify these, these different projects and maybe have shared components. Um, for instance, the Symbiote tool that Frank was showing is an obvious example of that. That's already a separate component. Uh, there's no reason why that wouldn't run on an Android with appropriate modification. So I think this is really a cool event in that sense. All right, um, so just one thing I want to show you is like the commercial side of this. Um, we, uh, it was kind of inspired by the, the last bullet of Jason's talk, which was um, if you have some idea you want to do, even though other people think it's crazy, just go ahead and do it anyway if you really believe in it. And this is, this is kind of our story of that. So what we're building, yeah, it's great. This is a, a test lab where you can basically you can send off Calabas tests and have them run on real devices. And I should say, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wasn't actually going to show the video because you have all the wires. It looks kind of it's way more neat now, and it's, this was a prototype. But the thing is, we re, we really think that running on devices is essential to uh, handling say fragmentation issues on Android. And this is why the, this is where the so the commercial side of um, of this painful comes in, is that we provide this uh, uh, hosted test environment where you can send off Calabash tests together with your app, and then have them run in these um, in this, we call them clouds or test hosted test environments. So what we provide is uh, of course support and training for Calabash, and then shared and private environments of these where you can run those. And it's really it's non, uh, it's authentic in the sense that we're running non-jailbroken devices and we run tests in parallel. And we provide sort of, um, say you've run on a number of Android devices and you want to look at what were the visual differences. And we have uh, what we call visual comparative test reports where you can see, I'll show you an example in a minute, but basically you can see what your app looks like on different models, um, and like at the same state but in different models. Yeah, and of course we support CI, um, and like exposure to different conditions is one of our, uh, we already do like different OS versions and languages, but um, one obvious thing is network throttling. So being able to uh, like cut off the connection during in the middle of a test or uh, just slow it down to run at edge speed. So um, yeah, 
just want to show you an example of what those visual test reports look like. Um, basically, what you have is that you have uh, device models up here, and uh, in this case, Android operating systems, and then you have <laughs> screenshots of your app, and then you get kind of stuff like this, weird graphical error happening in, in this particular model. And that's, those are the test reports that we provide. Um, I'm actually having a bit of difficulty controlling this. Uh, so if you go here. Ah. I will go into presentation now. Um, I was just going to show the, the test report versions where the uh, WordPress app I was testing, having just run the same uh, test case on Android and iOS, and then showing the, uh, the test reports corresponding to that. I can't seem to actually see where the mouse is, so sorry about that. Uh, the final thing before we do uh, questions is uh, this announcement that, that Pete already uh, had earlier, yeah. is that as of today, we are going to embrace uh, Frank as like a, a first class citizen in this uh, cloud, so in the sense that you can, you can submit Frank tests and have them be executed as well as, because the architecture is so similar, there's no reason not to. Uh, but also at the support level, we are going to provide uh, commercial support also for Frank, for companies that want to buy into that. Not. So um, that's actually it. Um, I guess I can take some questions now, if there are. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in uh, hybrid application testing. So as of today, uh, is there any way I can inject uh, my JavaScript uh, into the web view? Yeah, you can. And then uh, it returned uh, whatever result back? Sorry? It returned a uh, result back to uh, the script? Uh, no, not directly. I, you could do it indirectly. So uh, for example, let's say uh, I have a uh, you know, YUI test based, uh, you know, JavaScript test, right? So I want to inject uh, my YUI test inside the web view and learning inside the web view. And can I get, uh, you know, test result? Oh, I think I'm, I'm misunderstanding your question. Uh, no, I don't think you can, no. Oh, uh, not today? Okay. That's another one here. Can you just show us the example of script file, not feature file, but script file. A script file? Yeah, just so an example, any. Yeah. Um, yes. So is this not visible to you now? It's not. So what I wanted to do. So uh, let's do. Yeah, can you read this? So that's at the level of what are called step definitions, which kind of correspond to scripts. Uh, you're using Ruby code. Um, this is kind of an attempt to do a page object pattern. Um, you're grabbing a page object and then calling a particular method. I'm going to touch this WordPress block button, and they await for animations and so on. So that's, that's the kind of level you're phrasing your scripts on. But then you have, um, at the, uh, at the implementation of the page objects, you would have calls to the Calabash APIs to do, I don't know, perform touch events or, or query into the state and so on. Is, is that okay? Uh, what is the limitation of a Calabash if there's any difficult case for Calabash to deal with based on your uh, development experience? So like limitations uh, in Calabash? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 so it's inside the app. So if you say if you're running on a device and you want to, one example was switching the apps that um, um, Engon was, uh, was talking about. So that's not possible. And there are some limitations for security reasons, like um, if you want to, iOS is asking the user if you, uh, it, it can track location. And for security reasons, you can't actually access that. Uh, so that this is kind of the, because you're inside the app, uh, then that's, uh, that's kind of limits for security reasons what you can do. Um, other than that, it's a hybrid support I think could be a lot better. Um, uh, are you thinking of something specific? Uh, no. no? Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe another thing is uh, for interna internationalization test, if I test 10 languages, how to use Calabash to do that easily? Yeah. Um, well, you use, um, for iOS, you use accessibility labels or accessibility identifiers to actually find views. 
Um, so you use those. So you don't touch on, say, a particular text. If it's localized, you don't want to have your test script depending on that. So you kind of factor that out. Um, but you, certainly you could do it at the Ruby level. If you have access to the, uh, the files that define the localizations, like the strings files and so on, you can do uh, look at those from Ruby. And then depending on the locale you're running at. So it's, it's programmable. So, so it's really up to you. It's not a limitation in any way in the, in the technology. OK, OK, that's doable. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Thank you to Carl. Thanks.